spelling mistake. Localization is a term that supposedly has been launched by Japanese researchers who pointed out to a thing that is quite obvious but perhaps not to everybody, which is that it's not only that local ideas and practices become global, but also the other way around. That global ideas and practices arrive to various localities and then become translated into sort of a local variation. <coughs> which I personally find very interesting. And my topic, my sort of focus is the idea of operational risk and operational risk measurement. Now, I chose a metaphor which I think um, fits, and you will tell me whether you agree or not, this idea of operational risk. I don't know whether you uh, read Lewis Carroll, apart from Alice in the Wonderland, of course, there is this fantastic, absurdist poem called The Hunting of the Snark. There is a group of various people, highly professional, on the boat that are hunting for the snark, and nobody knows really what the snark is and whether it exists at all, but they are very keen on hunting it, and there is a lot of calculations included in the hunt. So this is what they say. Just the place for a snark. I have said it thrice. What I tell you three times is true. Taking three as the subject to reason about a convenient number to state, we add seven and ten and then mul multiply out by one thousand diminished by eight. The result will proceed to divide, as you see, by nine hundred and ninety-two. Then subtract 17 and the answer must be exactly and perfectly true. The method employed, I would gladly explain while I have it so clear in my head, if I had but the time and you had but the brain. And of course by you, Lewis Carroll doesn't mean you and I don't mean you, but all these other hunters to snark who don't quite understand the calculations but understand that the final result must be true. One more concept I think that I, I need to explain, as it were, is translation because it's understood somewhat differently than uh, in a narrow linguistic sense. Uh, this is a notion borrowed from sociology of translation. My friend Kuya Sivon and I were guilty of editing a book called Translating Organizational Change, and we borrowed it from sociology of science and technology, who borrowed it from French philosopher Michel Serre, who says that translation means what it exactly says, translation, putting something into another place. And then this thing is not anymore the same thing as it was. Because trans translation is both transportation and a transformation. So, for example, Bruno Latour says that it means displacement, drift, invention, mediation, creation of a new link that did not exist before and which modifies in part the two agents. Latour says that. When, whenever something is translated, not only what is translated has changed, but the translator changes too. He or she is the new person who has translated this thing. So, the result of translation is always a change. It can be changed for better, it can be changed for worse, but it is a change. Uh, it can be enrichment and it can be impoverishment, but it always no, nothing arrives at a new place in new time as the same thing. And that goes very well for management and business ideas and practices. So, I chose the operational risk, because I find it fascinating, as an example of such a trouble of an idea, uh, which maybe is not yet global, but it's certainly Translocal, it covers many places at many times. And of course, I am not able to, and I'm not going to, to bore you with presenting the whole travel. Actually, uh, the UK sociologist and accounting professor Michael Power, who is famous for 
writing first the book called The Audit Society and recently The Risk Management of Everything. He has described the sort of the very beginning of this idea uh, quite in detail and I think it's quite interesting. But I take it from a certain point in time, from a certain place. It's the Basel II Accord. You know what it is, the, the, the Basel, uh, the sort of a European Union Central um, Association, you could say, the, the organ that uh, gives directives to the banks and to the regulators in other countries and they meet and come with various accords and they have numbers and in the so-called Basel II Accords there came a definition of an operational risk that needs to be calculated and assessed by the regulators and banks in the EU countries. So this is how they define it. Operational risk is the risk of direct and indirect loss resulting from inadequate or failed internal processes, people and systems or from external events. And they have several categories. There is internal fraud, misappropriation of assets, tax evasion, uh, bribery. There is external fraud, theft of information, hacking damage, third-party theft, forgery. Then there is employment practices, the workplace safety, this is the usual thing, discrimination, health safety. Then there is clients, products, business practice, market manipulation, antitrust, improper trade, product defects, damage to physical assets, which can be caused by natural disasters, by terrorists and vandalism and business disruption and system failures and finally execution, delivery and process management data entry errors, accounting errors, failed reporting negligent loss of client assets as somebody said somewhat maliciously anything wrong that can happen can be counted as operational risk well in Sweden, we are famous for introducing EU regulations before they become obligatory. So by the time they are obligatory, they are already you know, put in life, actually. This, this was the same, same in this case, but uh, at the point when, when the Basel II Accord was a sort of just a uh, written document, my colleague Gunnar Wallström went to the Swedish banks and asked them simply what they think about this new idea of operational risk. And, much to his surprise, I think, they were quite positive. This is what they said, that the measurement of operational risk provides management with better grounds for decision making. It was trying to push them onto how exactly, but they refused to answer in the detail, but they claimed that it was very good. It produces a more positive image of the bank because a low operational risk indicates higher competence of the personnel and permits a lower level of regulatory capital. Here they were wrong, but it's, it was the future. Then, it is a valuable complement to credit and market risk measurements. They are specific uh, measurements used by banks and obligatory for a long time now. It improves clients' understanding of the bank situation too, they said. But, they said, that the definition is vague and abstract, making its proper measurement problematic. This was actually what I said, and it covers everything. This is one of the interviewees who said that they, yeah, it's very good, but it covers everything that can happen. And also, they said that they don't see how it's going to be calculated because the employees will not be willing to expose their own failings. They are not going to be saying, you know, I have the pro propensity to take bribes or I intend to, to commit a fraud or, you know, this kind of stuff. But actually, as I already indicated, uh, Gunnar was, was surprised that the, the, the reception was so positive. So actually he tried to figure out why they were so positive about this new thing. 
And this is what he said in conclusion. The Basel Committee's communication in the accord and its supporting documents is highly persuasive. What he means is that it's a rhetorical achievement, not so much an accounting achievement or regulatory achievement, but it's a very good and convincing rhetoric. The claims for the new accord are put forward in a technical way without discussion of potential advantages and disadvantages. And thus, it lulls the reader into a false sense of security, believing that the new accord is appropriate, valuable, and represents knowledge that can prevent future financial crises. Because, of course, the whole thing started as a result, as a response to the series of financial crises. In addition, the accord's approach to measuring risk by rigorous statistical models such as VAR is deeply rooted in the society and is manifested in a conviction that it is possible and appropriate to measure risk. But, he added, senior bank managers agree that the greatest risk areas are those that defy quantified measurements and pointed out that the most challenging task is to solve unanticipated problems. And this is common knowledge. You don't need to, to be a banker to know that, that the problem is always with what is, what has not been anticipated, what nobody expected to happen, rather than with things that can be predicted and expected. Well, the accords went into operations. My colleague Gunnar went back to the same banks afterwards, later, and asked in 2009, after the Basel Accord was accepted, and asked them how it works. And they said, that was because they were prepared a long time before, that their actual banking practices are very close to this kind of suggestion in the Accord, they said, well, there's nothing new, we do it anyway. And also, the sort of local translation, the local interpretation of this permitted the banks to use their own measurement practices. So they said, we do it our way. We know how to do it better. But what he said that is, this was the reaction from top managers. The operational managers were not that positive at all. What they said is that, and they were quite uh, unpleasant even to him, that said risk management is yet another idea that you guys in the university think up when you have nothing better to do. I mean, it's a theoretical world, it's a university world, it's a world that doesn't know anything about the banking. But soon it will be so that there will be just three people in each department who really understands the rules and who can explain them. And that goes especially for this statistical model of VAR. I don't know whether you've seen the movie uh, Margin Calls with Kevin Spacey, very interesting thing about banks. And this is exactly what Jeremy Iron says to one of the accounting specialists. Now speak plain English to me. I don't have a clue what you're speaking about when you're speaking about your models and stuff. It's enough that you know it. So there is this sort of a growing um, a gap between younger people and older people and between operational management and sort of strategic management and between people who really are experienced bankers and not. They also pointed out that the, the implementation of the rules were costly and that the relationship to reality of all these models and calculations very, very problematic. Also, they pointed out that the accord supports the tendency to centralization because this, all this is supposed to be calculated at one place on the top. And also, they were afraid, and they were right, that the Swedish supervisory authority will interpret the regulation much more strictly than authorities in other countries. Well, as you know, Poland is also an EU and the Polish banks 
and the banks operate in Poland had to um, apply, had to use the, the accord or adapt to the accord like anybody else. But I did have trouble with finding sort of a how and how it is explained by whom and to whom. I did a similar thing as I did in Sweden. I looked at the research papers and I looked at the textbooks and uh, I noticed that the risk management sort of appeared in the textbooks and in, in, in other texts around 2009-2010 but for example there was this book Accounting and Company Risk Management from 2010 very big book but completely fictive examples no research, no cases from, from, from the field um, and references were mostly to UK and US and Polish texts then there was a book called of Risk management, management with one chapter on operational risk and it says a very, it says a very strange thing, statistics again, that in UK the operational risk means six, it's 64% in procedures, 25% in people, 2% system and 7% external events. And it's very fascinating how could anybody uh, calculate it this way, but I've seen it uh, quoted several times. And then there was, there was a book called Management Accounting Strategic and Operational Approach with one chapter on risk again, focusing on sort of calculation of probabilities in decision making under uncertainty and imperfect information. Very much a technical thing about how to do it. I was still looking for the research results Uh, and apparently there was some survey in 1997 uh, undertaken by the British Banking Association, Coopers and Librand, but not in Poland, in UK. Uh, then there was, you know, they were quoting those uh, uh, sound practices for the management and supervision of operational risk. It's very interesting because it, sound practices have been translated into Polish as best practices. I don't know whether best practices are as fashionable in Lithuania like in other countries, but you know, best practices <coughs> sounds very good, like you know, you know what you're doing. And there was another assessment, source unknown, about how risks are uh, divided within the banks. 25 to 30% operational risk, 65 to 70% credit risk, and 10% market risk. Uh, observe that these are sort of a very arbitrary divisions of what is what they will be complaining, uh, they'll be complaining about as well, but still it is counted as if there were sort of solid numbers that can be put into percentages. There, were, there was no research as such, but there were, in one of the, the articles in Poland, there was speculation about the results for Poland of Basel II where they said that those different local translations may cause problems for international banks in Poland. Indeed, the Swedish banks immediately had a problem because they had this a problem comparative to the other banks because they had to introduce the, uh, the interpretation uh, enforced by the Swedish authority. It's probably the same thing here because I've seen that my bank, the Svenska Enschilda, is very, uh, very visible here. So it's they are problems competing with other bugs that do not follow the regulation so closely. Then, exactly what I was pointing about before, that the same events can be classified as market and operational risk, and they can be wrongly monitored, and the consequences may be difficult to ascribe to an appropriate category. And also that the measuring of operational risk would raise the required level of regulatory capital which Polish banks, who are quite poor, still would be a problem. And then finally I found something that can be called some research in a book, Risk in Accounting, 535 pages, and at the very end four pages with the interviews with four managers. And this is what they say, that the report on risk, but they mean only market and credit risk, may be useful if it remains internal. That means that nobody other but the bank 
you know, employees themselves know it. And the preparation of report is time and effort consuming. They said if we wanted to, to do this kind of stuff, we would have to employ new people from the university who are able to do these calculations for us and we don't have money to do that. Actually, it was very interesting the fact there was no research about, you know, reactions and interpretations. And I found out that Capgemini tried to do the survey on, on basic to among Polish bats in 2004, but there was no results because response rate was too low. So one journalist went to top managers anonymously and said, okay, why are you not answering it? And they said, well, the managers from industry said that banks do not have and do not collect appropriate data and they are afraid of spending money on uncertain investments like the <coughs> system that would permit them to do these calculations. And the bank manager said that it's another way of cheating them with money for new software, new IT specialists. There is indeed the whole branch of consultants that specialize only in that in software that is needed to, to measure the operational uh, risk. And they pointed out they are still too poor compared to their European equivalents. And they didn't want to answer Capgemini because they don't want to admit it. Simply. So what I did, I sort of compared the two translations, the two ways of translating, of taking in basically the same regulation. And I think that there is a sort of historical uh, background to it that explains quite a lot. You see, Swedish administration has very often important management ideas. And not only now, but you know, in, in good old times. For example, the city of Lübeck ran the city of Stockholm as, a, as an enterprise, as an experiment in a public enterprise. And the German called Konrad von Pichy saw to it that Gustav Vasa had the most, at that time, uh, uh, modern accounting system so that taxes could be properly collected. And the most dedicated capitalists at that time, the Dutch, to build, build, build the city I live in, Gothenburg. And the Swedish state and municipal administration very often draw an inspiration from the outside. Every time such an idea was imported, it was sort of adopted and transformed in, account, in encounter with local traditions. Whereas, and I'm here quoting a communist sociologist who is saying what follows, adoption of trends and, or fashions present in other cultural circles has always been practiced in various societies. And there is nothing wrong with that, assuming that those loans will be adapted to the local situation. Such an adaptation requires not only an idea of how to do it, but in the first place, a good knowledge of how it is being done locally. Unfortunately, the present reform, she's actually speaking about university reform, intends to introduce changes by the copy-paste method. And this is what I've heard from, from other sort of informal comments, that the problem is that because of the sort of post-socialist past, it is assumed that the existing experience is nothing to relate to. So the copy and paste method, uh, things taken from USA or from UK are simply sort of put in with the hope that they will work. They will work. They usually don't, which is not very strange. But again, I think there is a sort of uh, uh, more deeper sort of historical differences in, in how this, uh, how the approach for, for example, to the regulation and to accounting as such is, is perceived. Because, and this is I'm quoting Michael Power again, he's, what he, he was speaking about calculative pragmatist and calculative idealist. And the Swedes are really typical calculative pragmatists. They do count, but they count what they think is sensible and they count in the way that is useful. 
and they do have a very long successful banking experience. Of course, this is not their marriage because they didn't have the war, like most of us, but the fact is that they do have this sort of uninterrupted uh, experience. But also, and this is sort of very typical for the Swedish democracy, our authorities to talk to practitioners. They do not make decisions and issue regulations without talking to interested parties, be that bankers, other regulators, or whoever. And also, in the university, in the research, as you could see, there are lots of field studies and well, you, you couldn't see the log because I only quoted one, but there are many of these kind of field studies and they are done in a critical mode. And this is accepted and tolerated by the people in the field. Whereas in Poland there is this very strong tradition of idealism, sometimes I call it merciless idealism, and that goes for calculations too. There must be the right methods, there must be the proper things, and there must be sort of true results. There is, of course, very short contemporary banking experience. And also, authorities do not talk to practitioners. I mean, there doesn't seem to be an interesting uh, dialogue or platform. There are no field studies that I could locate, not in this field, but also I gave a whole uh, course, a doctoral uh, course at the Warsaw School of Economics. And Practically none of them, apart from sort of taking official statistics, and nobody did field studies. Our doctor students practically all do field studies. They go there, they talk to people, they read, they sit in the meetings, they read the documents. A completely different tradition. Well, maybe that there is no sort of critical mode of studies. It's it's understandable in the sense that in the when in West Europe the crit and in America, the critical mode of studies is still sort of based in Marxism, and as you understand, this is not very popular in the post-socialist countries. But there are there could be some different platforms for criticism as well. But also, I think in Poland I could see at least the sort of sediments of the past. Uh, there is the sort of the top-to-bottom approach. Uh, there are the initiatives are sort of centrally steered and the researchers are basically, basically supposed to translate to, but linguistically sort of explain to practitioners what the authorities on the top meant. The idea that they could go the other way around and report to the top authorities what practitioners do is not um, very much in vogue. But, and I think this is I, I think this is the, you may be thinking that my analogy to hunting for the snark and operational risk is exaggerated. Uh, so uh, as my last example from practice, I will quote again a, a, an example of Poland, uh, again about operational risk and about central risk re register in custom services. This is a very much a, a Top to bottom approach. This is Minister of Finance who decided that there is, and please don't laugh, that there is a great possibility of various kinds of risk uh, in people smuggling things through the borders. So they decided to count it, to calculate it as well. In order to optimize the efforts, means, and costs of operations, the customs service is obliged to focus inspection activities on the high-risk areas so that legitimate trade, which does not cause the danger of budget losses, violations of law, and other kinds of threats to the national economy and society as a whole, could proceed with services minimal interference. Currently, the Customs Service is working to identify the most serious threats in particular risk areas. And what I found very interesting, this is a letter Minister of Finance, not to the custom officers, it's to the 22 industry associations. Namely, it was the clients of the customs that were supposed to evaluate the risks and not the customs themselves. And in order to do that, a very complicated 
well, not complex in the sense, very difficult, but sort of long and complicated model of edge um, form was set to them. I'm not going to bore you with all of this, you can just look at it first. I mean, you were supposed to detail it, describe the threat, then to give the name of the goods or whatever, then showing the codes from the two customs tariffs, and then to show I mean, what was falsified and why, and what was the true thing, and then to do risk assessment on the scale of one, two, three. As you remember, from the hunting for the snark, whatever is counted to three must be true. And indeed, what is sort of surprising to me is the, the complication of the whole thing, and then this banality of these three things, high risk, low risk, medium risk. This is an excerpt, you know, there are, for example, precursors of drugs, poisonous chemicals and precursors, and then they're supposed to first describe it, then assess the risk, then, you know, uh, probability consequences, and it goes on and on for a very long uh, time. But then it goes from the one to three to the sort of um, assessment of the final assessment where the probability and consequences are put together. So it could be level one, level two, level three. And after this was uh, conducted in 2009, uh, the ministry came to a conclusion that custom services would concentrate its activities during 2010 on tobacco products, engine fuels, alcoholic drinks, tariff classification, and at the requirement of the Department of Customs and Excise on games of hazard. Now, I don't want to be unpleasant, but if the ministry went to the street and asked people on the street what, what are the most likely um, in fields in which the customs will be abused, as it were, they would tell them exactly the same thing. Tobacco, drugs, uh, alcohol and fuel. So all this incredibly complicated exercise uh, led to this rather trivial and to be expected effect. But again, I mean, this is not something invented by the Polish Minister of Finance. It's again cope and paste, but with a bit of differences in translation. They don't admit it, I mean, the, it's not that I push them, it's nowhere it's mentioned where from comes the, the idea, but it seems to me it's very likely that it comes from the UK, actually, because they have this, the, the National Audit Office had this very big program called Managing Risks to Improve Public Services, and they put one of the chosen uh, domains was exactly custom and excise. But what did they do? They did case studies. They went to uh, specific places and specific you know, custom offices and they tried to understand what is actually happening. Uh, it's true that they still have which is now everywhere, you will see it probably, they have this sort of risk assessments in the red, green, and what they call here, amber risks, and they have to do it every quarter, but they do really their best to, to sort of come in touch with reality and also listen to the practitioners. Whereas in the Polish Minister of Finance way of doing it, there was no mention of the models, they don't say where it comes from and why it should be done now. Uh, this peculiarity that risk assessment is being done by the clients um, of the customs, not the customs themselves. There are no case studies or no other studies of the practice. And somebody said that this is a technical way without discussion of potential advantages and disadvantages. They just sent a letter and said, do that, without sort of, there is no, or was no sort of open public debate about why should we do it and what for. Well, and so it goes. The ideas are traveling all the time. 
and translations continue. But what I want to point out is these differences in how local translation uh, are being done. I mean, the difference between sort of copy and paste and top to bottom uh, introduction of various ideas, models and things and the encounter with the local tradition where the local tradition has its say, as it were, has a discussion and I don't know, okay I, I'm not very convinced that the operational risk idea is of great value back to the hunting for the snack and the banker, in spite of the courage so new, it was matter for general remark, rushed madly ahead and was lost to the view in his zeal to discover the snark. Well, in a sense, I don't think that it matters what I think about operational risk or not. Because, in the sense, if people in the practice, in the field, are convinced that something works, that something is useful, then it, it will be useful. This is a you know, self-fulfilling prophecy, if you will. So it doesn't matter that you know, uh, researchers like myself are just reading it and commenting and sort of uh, having opinions on that this way or another. Although, of course, it would be pleasant if they involved us in, in the discussion, if they do it with But an imitation, this is like the, this published sociologist Wagner said, imitation and copying of models that seem to be working in other times is always has been and is going to continue but the very idea of how what to do when the sort of important idea hits the local ground <coughs> i think this is interesting and this is sort of worth focusing on uh, the ideas the global ideas and the fashionable ideas can be better can be worse, but the most important thing is this, to arrange for that encounter. And this encounter means the important ideas and the local traditions, the top authorities and the practitioners of the field. And perhaps, not the least, the researchers, the university people like ourselves, students as well, the theory and practice coming together. So this was exactly what I was trying to uh, present to you or suggest to you uh, as a rather important topic in those times when we were all in the common Europe. Observe that I didn't have any Lithuanian examples, partly because I don't know them, but partly because I do find out that it's always better to, to discuss somebody else because it gives sort of a necessary distance and, you know, and permits a more neutral and balanced idea. But actually, I'm very interested in how this kind of phenomena look like in Lithuania, not, with not only operational risk, but all kinds of imports and translations of ideas. Thank you very much.